When it comes to screenwriting, the prevailing wisdom is to show, not tell. Characters should show who they are by their actions and behavior rather than flat out telling the audience. But in the right place and at the right time, an expository monologue can be powerful, illustrative, and awesome. Especially within the horror genre. Because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Heather's monologue as she clutches a camera in the dark and apologizes to her parents is perhaps the most iconic moment of the Blair Witch Project. And I'm sorry to everyone. I was very naive. Partway through Joe Dante's Gremlins, after the titular creatures have taken over the town, one of our main characters decides to regal the audience with a story about why she hates Christmas. It turns out her father slipped and broke his neck while attempting to climb down the chimney dressed as Santa and the body wasn't discovered until several days later. In her words, And that's how I found out there was no Santa Claus. It's bizarrely macabre, but also extremely memorable. Speaking of Christmas, how about Silent Night, Deadly Night, when Grandpa comes out of his coma, unbeknownst to the adults, and suddenly starts talking to his grandson, Billy. His story comes as a warning about how Christmas Eve is the scariest night of the year. It's pure lunacy at its best. You see Santa Claus tonight, you better run for it. You better run for your life! <laughs> well, now you can add Mia Goff's Pearl to the top of the heap of all-time great horror movie monologues. Seems like there's something missing in me that the rest of the world has. Something's not quite right with Pearl, who wields a pitchfork less like a tool than a sex toy when tending the family farm. Such macabre behavior comes as no surprise to fans of Ty West's ex, who met the character in her advanced years, horny and homicidal, killing the amateur adult film crew staying on a the property, then feeding their pieces to a grateful alligator. Our prequel, Pearl, is set in 1918, some 60 years before the action of X. We meet Pearl as a young woman who is working hard on the family farm, longing for the return of her husband, Howard, who is away fighting in Europe. And she is also dreaming of making it as a dancer in the movies. The war is coming to an end and the Spanish flu is almost over, although Pearl still has to wear a mask when she goes into town on errands. But Pearl is deeply unhappy, and the lockdown has increased her frustration and her disturbing behavior. Her mother is strict to the point of cruelty, and her father has suffered a stroke and has to be tended to constantly. Pearl has a fling with the local movie theater projectionist, who shows her one of his secret stash of explicit stag movies, and the newsreels he shows about the war and the trenches are moreover bizarrely explicit and real. He encourages Pearl to follow her dream, break into pictures, and to that end, attend local auditions for a tour and dance but Pearl, her fingers always clutching around that pitchfork handle, is not going to take kindly to rejection in any form. Why are you leaving me if I didn't do anything wrong? I don't understand that's how you like me! What really holds the attention here throughout is Goff's multifaceted performance. She perfectly elicits Pearl's innocent hopefulness, her growing mania, and everything in between, keeping us hoping for her dreams to come true, even as we know she's heading down a nightmarish avenue. The climax of the film is an almost eight minute monologue where Pearl pours her heart out in a hypothetical confession to her husband. She reveals that she hated Howard for leaving her here. She reveals that she had been curious about other men and had slept with another man. She states that she had been flattered that someone like him, a handsome and good man, would pine over her. And she was mindful not to make him jealous as she was familiar with the twisted and rotten nature of that emotion, having suffered from jealousy over people whose lives were easy. She knew that Howard came from privilege and in him, Pearl had finally realize a way out of the stasis of her life. Thus, she knew she was lucky to have his attention, that he came from a life and a home straight out of the pictures, and she wanted to have that. But instead of taking her away, he wanted to stay at their farm. And that made her angry, thinking about his selfishness and everything she had done to make him happy. She then reveals that she had suffered from a miscarriage, but was relieved that it happened. And she could not bear the thought of being a mother and was repulsed at the idea of something growing inside of her. She then talks about some of the murderous mayhem that she's been up to. Terrible, awful, murderous things. I regret them now, but I liked how they felt. I wish I didn't, but I did. 
Even as Goth sobs out one tear after another to her sister-in-law, Mitzi, you can see the hope in Pearl's eyes that everything will be dandy once Howard returns. At the same time, a revelation seems to slowly creep into her mind. Times I wake in the middle of the night and the fear washes over me because what if this is it? What if this is right where I belong? As Jenna Raviccio noted in her review over at Cold Culture, of course she knows deep down that this is it. She'll be condemned to the farm forever. And it has nothing to do with how she only tried at being in show business once and failed, and everything to do with the arcane awareness that those born into a certain family and class will never be able to escape the curse of that station. As many stories before Pearl have proffered as a moral, all sources of pain and suffering can be traced to attempts at reaching for the stars. In other words, trying to extricate oneself from their circumstances circumstances of birth, something that her mother warns her not to bother with. One day you'll understand that getting what you want isn't what's important. Making the most of what you have is. But Pearl can't be told such like things. Like most, she's inclined to learn the hard way. Performance aside, because the performance is amazing, the content of the monologue helped to solidify Pearl as a sort of sympathetic villain. Normally movies like this garner sympathy by creating some sort of circumstance that forces a person to do something awful. It's sympathy for the situation because that situation is relatable. This monologue changed Pearl from a ruthless killer to a self-aware victim of mental illness. The whole why am I like this conversation is something that is rarely ever had in the context of a horror movie, and this monologue lays it out. Up until that point, it was hard to tell whether she was self-aware or not, or if she was just living in a fantasy world of her own making and never saw outside of that world. This monologue not only solidified that she is self-aware, but it solidified her humanity, despite her character being capable of things we'd largely consider inhuman. She doesn't understand why she acts out or has outbursts, or why she doesn't feel remorse in the same way as others. And it's sad. We're not supposed to feel these feelings about people who are cold-blooded killers, but one could argue, it's really important that we do. We rarely discuss the morality or struggles that come with psychopathy. The monologue in this movie does a brilliant job of showcasing the inner struggle of someone who is a psychopath, knows that they are different from everyone else, and is powerless to change that. Of course, you can extrapolate this to mental health in general, but when we are talking about people who hurt others, it can be much, much harder to sympathize with their situation. You're not gonna say anything, are you? Horror prequels like this, flashing back to a villain's formative years, have always been a tricky business, as explaining, often over-explaining, what made them the killers they became risked robbing them of their mystery and menace. Did we really need to see Michael Myers screaming like a little girl as a kid? And indeed, since we know where its title character winds up, Pearl works not so much as a suspenseful thriller, but as a character study, dependent on its central performance in which its star delivers in spades. It's the Mia Goth show from start to finish, which she and our director have tailored to display her many and considerable strengths. Nobody has to know. I can fix things. Among the spectrum of emotions associated with the horror genre, nothing builds dread and uneasiness quite like the feeling of genuine sympathy. While many villains who take pleasure in depravity are unworthy of compassion, there are the hapless and pitiable antagonists whose sickening actions, paired with their somewhat understandable motivations, make for an unsettling concoction. Before Jason Voorhees became a killing machine from beyond the grave, he was just a boy. Born with a birth defect that distorted his facial features, Jason was bullied and tormented by the residents of Camp Crystal Lake to his apparent death. Granted, in the original film, Jason wasn't the killer. That was carried out by his traumatized mother, who also falls into the sympathetic villain category, and who also delivers a memorable monologue for the ages. Did you know that a young boy drowned the year before those two others were killed? The counselors weren't paying any attention. When Jason finally arrives on screen in part two, he has an ax to grind, quite literally. Not only is he mentally scarred from years of physical and psychological abuse, but he is also without a mother, the only person in the world who showed him any kindness. To carry out his revenge on Camp Crystal Lake is all he understands. These people have to pay for what they did to him. So, what's the moral of the story? It's that a little sympathy can go a long way. I'll do anything you want. It's not about what I want anymore, Mitzi. It's about making the best of what I have. No. No.